All right, so today I want to talk a little bit about my favorite group of exercises, as you all know, Hannon, the not-so-virtuoso pianist, and why I stopped practicing Hannon. <clears throat> now, as hopefully all of you know, Hannon is not my favorite. In fact, technical exercises in general are not my favorite. And I'm going to take a brief moment and talk about that. But the thing that I want to say first is that what I want to explain is I want to make a case for why practicing Hannon in the traditional way is actually not very effective for most people. <clears throat> and the reason why I want to talk about this is that I have a short where I talk a little bit about Hannon and the pitfalls. And the majority of the comments that I get on that short actually are basically people telling me that I just did something wrong. And I'll agree with them. I did do something wrong. I practiced Hannon, and I listened to the way the book, assumedly written by Hannon, the preface and the instructions on each page for each exercise. Um, I, I'm pretty sure Hannon wrote that. Anyway, I listened to that advice, and that was the problem. So first of all, the reason why I'm not really a big fan of technical exercise in general is that the idea is, and this goes back to even before Cherney, okay? The idea is that if you repeat some sort of musical or technical pattern over and over and over again, you'll get better at it. And, and there's truth to that, okay? And the idea is, is that if you just practice these patterns enough, you'll build strength and dexterity and you'll eventually get flexibility and, you know, whatever in your plane and then that'll be great, okay? Now, this can happen for some people. The human body is incredibly, um, it's like an incredible machine in the sense that it's adaptable, okay? So in the same way that someone who lifts heavy weights, they get bigger, okay? They bulk up in many ways. Obviously, you have to eat enough food to do that, enough calories, um, protein, whatever, but your body adapts to that environment. Um, you'll see like metal iron workers, um, they'll actually be quite burly, sort of strong uh, men because they're, they're, the, the work is very demanding and their bodies adapt to that environment. Um, con in contrast, you see runners, people that run, you know, miles every, you know, every day, really. They, they get smaller, they get leaner, but not just with their body fat, they also lose muscle mass because your body says, hey, we don't really need all this extra muscle because we need to be lighter so we can go faster so it's easier. So the human body is incredibly um, adaptable in that sense. And many people, when they practice the piano, they play pieces, they play scales, arpeggios, octaves, double thirds, pieces, whatever. And their body adapts to that and they learn how to move efficiently. One of the things, there's a study recently that I heard about where they actually studied piano players in particular. And one of the things, that they noticed is that if you play a passage and you stop and just sit motionless without really thinking about anything, your brain will replay that passage forwards, backwards, at you know two times speed, half times speed, etc. Your brain is sort of like trying to figure out how more efficient you can get at this passage. And so, you know, one of the suggestions relating to specific piano playing was essentially you know you can actually be more productive with practicing less because you you play a passage and you sit there quietly and keep your mind sort of blank and your your body will actually say okay i'm going to figure out how to get more efficient at this okay so your body will do that yes and many people do right listen to the advice of a lot of famous pianists they say practice your finger exercise i saw this little clip where where I don't, I, you know, I don't remember, I don't know what the situation was, but someone, you know, came up to Valentino Lacitza and says, oh, you know, what's your advice for people who, you know, want a career in, as a pianist or whatever? And she said, practice your finger exercises and never give up, you know, keep practicing. That's all she said, right? And that is a lot of people's experience. And so that kind of goes along with the, the Charney Hannon technical exercise camp of, well, yeah, it works. I got an interesting comment actually on that Hannon short where, the, where this person said that, you know, well, you know, over the last 150 year, 
years, millions of people have had the opposite experience. So you, you must be an exception to this or something to that effect. Um, and that is the, the idea that many people have. They, the, the idea is that it works for most people that do it. Well, the reality actually is the opposite. You think that there's something wrong with you because just practicing Hannon and following the advice that, that Hannon gives in, in the preface and on each page, you know, for each exercise, you assume that you're not getting anywhere because you're, not, you're just not giving it your all or you need to do it more or there's something wrong with you, okay? But actually that's most people's experience. Unlike what most people think, Hannon does not have that magical effect. If I actually open to the preface, it says that this entire volume can be played through in an hour, and if, after it has been thoroughly mastered, it be repeated daily for a time, difficulties will disappear as if by enchantment, and that beautiful, clear, clean, purling execution will have been acquired, which is the secret of distinguished artists. Okay, so this is the claim. Um, and this is why people assume that practicing Hannon will do that. And I, at one point, also assumed that, okay? But that's actually not what most people experience, okay? So in that original Hannon short, what I basically said was, you know, I, I did what Hannon asked me to. You know, I followed the advice, you know, and, and here's what it gives, okay? On the, the very first page of the first exercise... It says stretch between the fifth and fourth fingers of the left hand in ascending and the fifth and fourth fingers of the right hand in descending. In order to do that, you have to keep your arm in a still position and really stretch. And so what, that's actually what most people say. Keep your arm still. You know, it's all about the fingers. It's about stretching. And I even, uh, this is a long time ago at this point, but I heard a teacher talking to a parent who was saying, you know, their, their child who was taking lessons with this teacher was having a little trouble with the Hannon. I think it was just the first exercise. And they said, you know, the, some of the intervals are, are kind of wide and their hands are small. And the teacher said, well, actually, you know, that's a good thing. You know, the exercise will actually be really, really good for that. It'll help them really stretch between the fingers, increase their hand span and, you know, whatever. And I was sitting there and even at the time, I knew that that was bad advice. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, can't say anything. It's not my student, you know. Um, but it was um, kind of upsetting because people don't know better. They read the preface. They say, well, here's what Hannon says. You know, isn't, you know it, must, it must work, okay? Now, the reason why I say that most people's experience is not that the difficulties disappear as if by enchantment is because I have been to um, you know, a lot of essentially piano conferences and things where I've met over a number of years, hundreds of people who, same thing. My teacher just gave me all these technical exercises. I did exactly what they told me and I got hurt. Uh, my students, uh, fellow students when I was young, um, other teachers, etc. The list goes on and on. So most people do not actually experience that. Now I have a number of people who have commented and said, well, I, you know, Hannah was really helpful for me. That's great. But you have to understand that it's not literally the patterns that are somehow magical, right? Um, it's how you're playing them. And that's the whole thing. It's interesting because a lot of times I'll have people comment, say, you're just overcomplicated, just go practice, you know, whatever. But it's interesting, I'll get these comments occasionally that are like, wow, this is interesting because it reminds me of efficient drum technique. And I'm like, so why is it when it comes to drumming, we can acknowledge that there are efficient and inefficient ways of doing it. Some will get you tired and tense, and other ones you'll be able to play fast and be in control and not get tired and tense. But when it comes to piano playing, it's like, that is heresy, you can't say that, right? I, I don't really understand why, but that's the way it is. Now, another objection that people had was that, you know, I used the word mindlessly in the short. I said, you know, Mindlessly repeating cheering and hand and exercises won't help you. Now, at the time, my thought was mindlessly meaning you're not thinking about how you're moving or how you're using your body. You're just like, just with the fingers and not really, you know, it's like, you know, right. 
Um, John Mortensen calls it insectoid-like plane. You know, it looks like an insect crawling along, right? Um, to me, you know, that's mindless. And people basically jumped on that and said, well, that's the problem, you were doing it mindlessly. No, I wasn't doing it mindlessly, okay? Everyone that I know who hurt themselves doing it didn't do it mindlessly. They were trying to keep the rhythm even, they were trying to keep the notes even, they were lifting their fingers high and stretching between the fingers just like Hannon says, okay? So I think it's important to understand those couple of things, right? Um, following the advice that Hannon gives actually injures a lot of people, okay? Now it doesn't injure everyone because again, some people's bodies will adapt. They will get a little bit more efficient within whatever they're doing. And so there'll be enough good stuff going for them that they won't get hurt. Another thing of course too is if you try to hold your fingers down and lift them and play them independently and stretch between the fingers, hold the forearm still, that's a recipe for tendonitis. That's what happened to me. However, if you just start playing, you learn the pattern and it progresses in speed quickly and all of a sudden you're lifting your fingers together and you're dropping them independently and you're actually using rotation and you're aligning your arm behind your fingers and you don't even realize it, that's what happens. If you find a teacher who plays it really, really well and fast, if you slow, de slow it down, you'll see that that is what they were doing. It might not be perfect. They might be stretching a little. Their arm might not be moving as well as it could be, which ultimately will be holding them back. But they are doing that to some degree. Otherwise, you cannot play hand in that well or you will get injured. Okay. Now, another important thing that is, is something that when I first heard, um, it actually blew my mind because most people don't know this. Okay. Question. Who was Hannon? Who was he? What do we know about him? So, you know, List wrote a book of exercises. And List was, you know, one of the greatest pianists of his generation. Maybe one of the top 10 greatest pianists of all time. I mean, that's debatable. But, I mean, he was an incredible pianist, artist, composer. So, if you were to say, well, I think that his exercises, his book of exercises, should be taken seriously and studied, we'd say, okay, sure. Well, what if some random person from Ohio, who doesn't even play the piano that well, writes some exercises? Are we gonna take their exercises seriously? Well, no, we're not, right? Because what reason would we have to? Fair enough. So again, we go back to the question, well, who was Hannon? What do we know about him? Well. And you can do your own research here, but Hannon lived in France in the countryside. He was a church organist and he taught piano lessons to local students. That's all we know about him. Was he a virtuoso? We don't know. Did he have great technique? We don't know. Did he play really well? We don't know. We don't know any of the, the answers to those questions. So you, so that might lead you to say, well, yeah, why do we take Hannon exercise so seriously? Now, obviously his exercises have been um, very popular. And probably the reason for that was at the time, that style of exercise was a bit less common. You know, Cherney exercises are like pieces that are exercises. These are not pieces, it's not music, it's just an exercise, right? Um, so it's a little bit unique in that way. Now the other thing is, if you read the preface, it's basically claiming to be this perfect study of for technique or this perfect um, course for technique. Um, it says pianists and teachers who cannot find time for sufficient practice to keep up their playing need only to play these exercises a few hours in order to regain all of the dexterity of your fingers, right? And essentially, if you read the preface, um, it's, it's a selling point, it's trying to sell, you know. It's trying to sell the exercises. And the idea is, you know, it says here, if all the fingers of the hand were absolutely equally well trained, they would be ready to execute anything written for the instrument. And the only question remaining would be that of fingering, which could be readily uh, solved. Let's just stop right there for a second. That is a ridiculous statement. I mean, that is absurd, okay? You know, I actually got a comment on my Hannon video. And this person said, well, Praxing Hannon certainly didn't help me learn Chopin's first etude. And it's like, 
Exactly. So, you know, that statement <laughs> that it makes here, um, anything written for the instrument would just be, uh, you know, just figure out your fingering and you're fine. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous statement. Now, a little caveat here with, with hand and exercises. I don't hate them, just so we're clear. And, you know, I've heard people make the argument that hand and exercises are exhaustive in the different kinds of patterns that you find throughout the 60 exercises. And, you know, there's they're the same kind of movement patterns and, and different technical patterns as we find in music. And I think that that's largely true. Um, personally, I find it more beneficial to practice scales, exercises, um, I'm sorry, scales, arpeggios, you know, octave scales, octave arpeggios, um, scales of the third, sixth, and tenth, contrary motion, etc. Because we find those patterns more directly in music, and then we're actually learning our scales, which is helping with our understanding of theory, understanding music more. We see scale fragments in the music and chords and all that kind of stuff, right? So I find that personally more beneficial. But yeah, you could certainly, if you had good technique, you you know, and you understood how to apply it, you could practice these exercises and it's fine, right? It's not about what you play, it's about how you play. And that's something that is really important to understand. It's not about what you play, it's about how you play it. You can play hand and exercises in a way that is, you know, biomechanically sound, and you can play them, and you can play them really well. And it will help you be really familiar with lots of different patterns, right? Um, but if you don't do that, if you follow the advice that Hannon gives, you're going to get into trouble because it's not what you play, it's how you play it. Okay, I've made this argument many times before, but if you watch really great pianists, you watch them play, and pianists who don't have problems, you know, so excluding people like, for instance, Glenn Gould, and I know there's going to be people that are going to get upset about this, but Glenn Gould struggled pretty much his whole career with issues, pain, and other problems, okay? He had severe back problems, etc. And he had other, other issues, okay? And many people don't know that, so I wouldn't try to analyze his technique because he had some good things, that's why he did as well as he did, but there was a lot of problems with his technique. But if you watch a good pianist, you know, Leon Fleischer is another example of that. He got injured pretty early in his career, injured his right hand, you know, and never recovered. When he died at like 96 or something, he still had an injured hand. He played for his students, demonstrated with his left hand, okay? So I would not try to analyze his technique. But if you watch, if you watch great pianists who don't have problems, they're healthy, right? You analyze what they're doing, what you see is it's all about movement, right? It's not about having strong independent fingers and all these things. Those are ideas, but they're more of an illusion than anything else, right? It's about how you move. People have said this before, absolutely so important to understand. Playing the piano is all about movement. It's all about learning how to move. So yeah, I mean, I could make a series of 60 videos and I could outline every single hand and exercise, how to do it technically, how to move, right? And that could be really helpful to people. But what's more helpful to understand is change the focus. Understand that there's nothing magical about Hannon. When, he's, when it says in the preface that as if by an enchantment, all difficulty just disappears, that is a fairy tale. That is not true. That's something that may have been Hannon's experience. He may have come up with these exercises and he had this experience or some of his students had this experience because their technique just started working and they didn't know why. He didn't know why. He didn't, they didn't understand it, right? Um, my, my teacher mentor, okay, she told me that she said, you know, when I was young, I didn't really have a teacher who talked to me about technique. He would just say, you know, keep your arms pretty still, really, you know, independent fingers. And she said that, you know, I think just what naturally started happening is I would just use that, a little bit of rotation and it just sort of started working on its own because she's like, I, that's how I play, but no one taught me to do that. It just started happening. And she had some instruction, you know, in the Russian school a little bit, 
but not to the extent of you have a lot of Russian teachers that talk about weight and all this kind of stuff, right? So it was discoveries that she made later and it just worked. And that's a perfect example, again, of someone who at a later point in life understands all of this stuff and largely figured it out by just analyzing their own plane. What am I really doing here, right? And what's interesting to me is people ask me all the time, oh, are you familiar with the Taubman approach? Because you know, Dorothy Taubman's famous for teaching rotation and all these kind of things. And the idea that your fingers aren't really independent from each other, right? They talk about this idea of codependence. Your fingers are actually dependent upon each other to move and you have to understand that, right? Well, the thing is, is that, yeah, my teacher didn't learn that from Taubman or reading Matei or anything else. She just sort of figured it out because that's how she plays. And to me, that's proof that everyone who plays piano really well and does not develop problems or doesn't have problems, they're doing the same kind of thing because ultimately we all have a body that functions in the same way. Yes, our hands are slightly different. Fingers are longer or shorter. Our forearms are longer or shorter, etc. And that changes things slightly. There's little adjustments that have to be made, but more or less, it functions in the same way. The same principles guide. Okay, so that essentially is why I stopped playing hand, and, and specifically, it's because I developed tendonitis in my right arm so bad that I couldn't play for about a month, and it was very tender when I returned to the instrument, and this is when I first met my teacher, and so. She was very sensitive to that and helped me start playing. And because my playing started changing in a drastic way, that problem just went away. But it's, it's not an issue. This is another thing people have mentioned. Well, you just did it too much. It's like going to the gym, you know, you have to let your muscles rest. I know that makes sense, but the problem is actually that why is it that now I can practice four or five hours a day, I don't get tired, like, I, I don't get fatigued and have to take a break, right? I don't get tired, I'm not sore the next day, I'm not tense, this and that, whatever, right? Why is that? Well, you've just built up more strength, you know. No, because even in the past, right, I get injured, and then within, you know, six months, I'm rehabilitated and I'm playing, and I'm playing all of this stuff that I never thought would even be possible, no fatigue, no pain, I'm not sore the next day, right? because fundamentally the way that I'm playing changed, right? Instead of stretching and pulling and pushing and twisting and everything else, I was playing using my whole body in a cohesive way. So yeah, I mean, I can sit down and I could learn these exercises and I could play them and I could play them really well and they wouldn't hurt me now because it's how you play. It's not what you play, it's how you play. And I, I think one point that I think is really important to understand, and I want to mention this, is that I got a comment on one of my videos recently, and this, this commenter said, you know, I really appreciate your approach because it takes the mysticism out of technique. And I love that, right? Because so often you watch all these different um, YouTube teachers or any teacher, really, and they'll say, oh, I came up with this quick little tip to kind of help with tension and this little thing. You know, and it's something like, well, you're gonna play each note, and you're gonna like shake out your hand, get rid of that tension, right? And it's like this, well, why does that work? I don't know, it just, it, you know, there's just, I don't know, there's tension, it's like, okay. And it's like a quick little tip, but it's not like, well, this is why, this is what causes the tension, and here's how to get rid of it. It's just like, I, yeah, I don't know, it's like mystical. No one really knows how it works, you know? Um, but that's not how technique actually is. And, and I want to mention this book. This is a book by Neil Stannard, Piano Technique Demystified. And it's that idea, again, of demystifying technique. Because that is a very common thing. People think of it as this mystical thing. I, I don't know why it works, right? It's like, I was practicing and I just couldn't get it. And then one day it just, oh, all of a sudden it, it worked. Well, because you're doing something different. Something, something else is happening, right? Um, and I think that that is a really important thing to, to sort of understand is, is that just like, you know, we understand why we can build a building and it won't fall down or bridge, right? 
engineers know how to do that because they understand load bearing and how to support the structure efficiently, sufficiently and, and everything else, right? Well, it's no different when we play the piano. Like, you know, I, a student comes to me and says, oh, I'm having this problem and I'll say, well, here's why. Bam, right there. It, it's not some mystical thing of, well, I don't know, you know, go drink some tea before you practice and take lots of breaks and take a hot bath before and after, take an Epsom salt bath or whatever. It's like, no, don't do these things. These cause problems. Do these things, okay? And to me, it's, it is, it's been a process, you know, over many years, but it's so freeing because you understand that there's not something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your fourth finger. There's not something wrong with you because you couldn't hack it, right? The reason why there are relatively few people who say, I practice hand and it just was like magic. It was, it's just as if by enchantment, right? There's not something wrong with you. It's almost something wrong with them, okay? And not that there's something wrong with them, but they're the exception, not the rule. There is a study that was done, I think in 2016, um, something like that, uh, a poll that polled pianists. And they found that over 50% of people that responded, which was over a thousand people, um, had some sort of piano relating pro related problem, injury, or they de are dealing with tension, can't figure out why, right? So it's a problem, right? It, it's a really big problem and you have to understand how to address that problem. So the reason why I make these videos, the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because constantly when I get these comments and people, ah, oh, I don't know, just stop making it complicated, all this kind of stuff, they're like, no, no, no. See, I'm making it simple. I will tell you exactly why you're having this problem and you can fix it. And I have students that fix these problems all the time and you would not believe how impassioned and excited they are because they've spent years struggling. Okay, I'm actually making it simple. We make it complicated when we don't understand and we follow bad advice from people that we assume to be experts, but maybe they just weren't, you know, maybe they weren't ex experts. Maybe he wasn't even a good organist at his church. We don't know, right? And so I think it's important to question these things. It's important to think about these things. And it's important to understand, to take any amount of mysticism out of what we're doing. And when you do that, you'll make much more progress because you can always find someone who will say anything you can imagine. There are people, great pianists, even good teachers, who say it's all in the fingers, just strong fingers, okay? And they'll have students who play really well. So you're like, must be true, right? But what about all the students that can't hack it? You know, what about them? Why is that? And I think that the te testament of great teaching is when you have a teacher, when all of their students, and they're not just like highly selective, only work with people who already sorted that stuff out, right? But you have a teacher who has all the students, they have that solid foundation for technique, right? So. Hopefully that gives a little bit more insight into why I stopped practicing hand and why it's not my favorite. I do occasionally use it with some students. If I, if I want to give them something, they want an exercise and I want to work on rotation or circular motion or whatever it is, I'll give them a hand and exercise and work with them on the technique, the foundation, how to practice it and kind of go on. But overall, I prefer scales and arpeggios. And I uh, actually kind of enjoy practicing scales and arpeggios, which people tell me is strange, but that's just me. So I hope this video was interesting, informative, enjoyable, and also demystifying piano technique. If you have any questions or comments, drop them down below. Thank you guys so much and have a great day.